Welcome to the April 19th, uh, 2016 City of Half Moon Bay City Council meeting. Roll call, please. Here. 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 Here, thank you. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much and a special welcome this evening to the members of Half Moon Bay High School's AP Gov class who are here for the love of government and as required for a grade. Um, I have no proclamations or presentations this evening. Um, announcements of community activities. I am not immediately aware of anything yeah, coming up. Uh, Councilmember Muller, any community activities? I'll, I'll try to help you, and everyone else can jump in too, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think we have Dream Machines. Oh, oh that's coming up. Okay, yeah. And we have Earth Day that's coming up Friday, I believe, staff. And compost will be available, and I don't mean to be taking your... Uh, I don't have any. Just keep going. <laughs> and uh, Thursday night, April 19th, uh, Sun Rhesus is having their... Uh, is it the 28th? Oop, I'm sorry, I got it on the wrong calendar, but at least it's coming up on the 28th. I should know better because that's my wife's birthday, so maybe there'll be a little conflict. But anyway, uh, so we got Earth Day, uh, uh, Dream Machines, and uh, um, I think that's all I had for you, sir. Thank you very much. Well, that's three more than I had on my list, so thank you for that. Um, and with that, we'll move on to a report out from closed sessions to the city attorney. Thank you. The only reportable action taken was in regards to closed session item number two, where the council voted to initiate litigation. However, we will not be identifying the defendants until the uh, initiation of litigation has been formally commenced and process has been served, and then we will disseminate all the information to any member of the public who's interested. Thank you very much. Um, city Council reports. This is uh, to, to our AP Gov students. As I described, we go through this process and linear. Um, as City Council members, we do uh, a lot of things besides sit on, at the City Council meetings and preside over these meetings. And this is where we report on our other activities in the community and other communities. So r write something about that in an essay. Um, to uh, Council Member Frazier. I just have my list of budget reports tonight. I don't have my list where I attended, so I will spare you those details tonight. Thank you, Councilmember Penrose. Um, keep meetings and PCE meetings, and um, that's enough. Peninsula Clean Energy. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Muller. Yeah, I believe there's a, a, a reminder that the upcoming June ballot has some very important uh, local initiatives on them. Uh, one we're all aware of is Measure F, and I want to ensure that people are aware of that one. And the other one is uh, for uh, a modest parcel tax increase. It's uh, uh, for the Bay's health, it's uh, Measure AA. I'd like everyone to review and look at that very closely. It's for the nine Bay Area counties, and it's a, a very serious issue for the future of our Bay's health and uh, wetland issues. and potential sea level rise. So those two, I think, are very important for us to get a handle on. Thank you very much. And Vice Mayor uh, Ruddick. Yes, on Saturday I attended um, Coastal Wildflower Day at uh, Francis State Beach. And uh, it was a wonderful event. They opened their native plant nursery for sale of, of plants. I stocked up, it was a good deal. Uh, they had wonderful food and, and music. And uh, it was a really nice event, and of course it was a beautiful day. The weather was, was wonderful. Uh, I attended a, a sewer authority budget workshop uh, last evening, and then a couple of weeks ago a recycled water uh, project meeting. I attended farm day luncheon. I'm reporting on that because I was sick for our last meeting. I attended the, um, the diabetes dinner fundraiser um, prior to that. 
And um, I think that's it. Great, thank you very much. I have just a few events I participated in relevant to uh, us this evening. I was invited to and met with the Coastside Mothers Club to give them an update on different activities going on in the community. Uh, just covered basic city things and projects, a lot of interest in the library, a lot of interest in our parks. Just really looking to be, um, they were interested to know more about what's going on. A couple eyebrows raised a couple times. It's very interesting. They said, oh, I didn't know that, that was going on. So I was happy to do that and kind of reach out to them. I attended the graduation of the Karen program at, um, at Moonridge and uh, uh, congratulated each of, I think there were 50 or was it 100? I forget. 50 or 100 graduates of this program, uh, much like our community academy, only uh, run uh, in the county, and uh, with the group of uh, families or people from uh, Moon Ridge get together and they go through the. They have dinner the evening and they have a program where they learn learn about being more engaged in their neighborhoods. And I forget what Karen stands for, but I know the the. Um, uh, RON is revitalizing our neighborhoods, and I forget the CA, but, <laughs> but uh, basically the, the premise is revitalizing our neighborhoods and being involved in the community and, and being, a, being comfortable to access uh, services available to, to the community. Uh, and so I participated in that. And then I um, uh, also participated in the Sewer Authority Mid Coast Side budget session, budget meeting yesterday, and we made some good progress, and there's some options coming back to us. Uh, and thankfully, that me meeting did not take until midnight, so I was happy about that. I ran a good meeting. Uh, the vice mayor ran a good meeting, I've got to be honest. That, that was pretty smooth. Uh, and with that, we go to city manager updates to council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, council member Muller just mentioned Earth Day activities that we'll have on Friday. And I'd ask, like to ask uh, Captain Muncie to join us at the podium to provide a little update on the uh, report on the triathlon from the weekend. Excuse me, what was the introduction? Uh, that's, that's Captain Muncy. So I'd, I think uh, I'd like to also congratulate him. Congratulations, on his Captain. Bravo. I think I'm happy to report, too, that I believe I'll be staying in this great city. Um, Ms. Gonzalez would know. Um, I'm happy to report out on the triathlon that I really don't have anything to report out on. It went really well. Um, we had one bicycle crash, and other than that, minor traffic, but everything went really smooth. That's perfect. That's exactly, we, we were um, discussing uh, casually earlier this evening, like, oh, were there any issues with the triathlon on the coast? And the fact that none of us, the, the fact that we heard nothing was perfect, um, considering several years ago there was some problems. So this is really great, so we're happy to hear that. Yes, I checked my voicemail three times uh, just to ensure that I didn't get any messages, but everything went really well. Uh, thank you for the city, all the coordination, and that's what made it happen. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. And to the city manager, is that, is there, are there more? Is that, that concludes my report, thank concludes you. Concludes your reports. Great, the next item on our agenda are, uh, is the public forum. To our Gov students, if you would like to speak to the City Council tonight or ever, you can complete one of these blue forms, give it, uh, put it in a little box in the end, and then you can approach the mic at this time and uh, address the City Council. Um, so the, uh, the first speaker is Harvey Rarbeck, followed by, oh, Shirley Holly. Uh, good evening, Council, Harvey Rarbeck. Um, there's been an item that's been uh, come up more than once, and I want to emphasize how important I think it is, and it's on your strategic plan, and uh, it's something that we really need to address because this is extremely important, and that's affordable housing. Um, the person who helps clean our condo had her rent uh, increased by $1,000 because the landlord could get away with it, and consequently, she had to move out. Um, there are many ideas that are floating around for how we can have affordable and low-cost housing. Uh, it would be wonderful if we could have something uh, close to services on Main Street. Uh, we could also increase uh, infill, have mother-in-law units, uh, have uh, an ordinance that would prohibit uh, the kind of rent increases that uh, my uh, helper uh, experienced. 
So I urge you to think creatively and do what is necessary to be able to increase the housing stock in Half Moon Bay for affordable housing. It's really important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shirley, followed by John Ullum. Good evening. I'm Shirley Holly. It's uh, great to come here and see so many familiar faces. It's wonderful. Um, so uh, the wind was knocked out of my sails a little bit uh, because I came in at the last of the prior meeting and I saw that the city council is concerned about all the things that trouble me. That is uh, engagement with all the neighborhoods of our community, everyone, including uh, services to uh, Spanish, our Spanish-speaking neighbors and also uh, your concern about uh, the housing crisis. I echo Harvey's concern there. I think we're all worried about it. Um, we need immediate action. We don't like to keep uh, talking to the next person about how they're living in one bedroom with their family and having to share a bath. So uh, I remain available to uh, help with anything um, that I could offer. Thank you. Shirley, thank you, and thank you very much for your generous offer, and um, I, I will be very delighted when the time comes for us to take you up on that. John Ullum. John Ullum, thanks for having me up here. Uh, first thing, I'd like to um, correct uh, two mistakes that I made at uh, the last public meeting we had here. I uh, said basically something to the effect that um, uh, library finance attorneys had uh, uh, informed Mr. Galagli that there was a problem with the TPA. In fact, those were not attorneys, they were advisors, so I got that wrong. And the other thing was is that I had said that it had gone from those advisors directly to Mr. Galagli, and I was wrong about that. Uh, Alex was in the, in the middle of that conversation, so I do want to acknowledge that I did get those wrong. Um, the rest of those, I'd like to comment on what the other two speakers have mentioned about affordable housing. I think the one angle we should consider is, is that we have a pile of tax revenue from sales tax and from transit occupancy taxes. And that's what's paying for a lot of good things in our community. But we have to look at who are the workers that actually make those engines of tax generation work. Who are the people that are making the Ritz such a profitable operation that it can spin off the kind of money it spins here? Who are the people that are doing the work you know, in, to produce the agricultural products in the fields? There's a lot of people in this town, this town needs, you know, that we absolutely count on to be here. And we're, we're reaching a point where we're gonna have people who make over $100,000 a year exiting in the morning as buses come back over the hill with people who make the minimum wage to make those economic engines that pay for all the really cool things that we've got now work. As you know, most of our revenue comes from sales taxes and transit occupancy taxes. So when considering the, you know, what these folks are talking about and you know, what we um, need to do to keep this uh, community, a working, functioning community where we don't have an, an economic apartheid where there's this crazy commute in the morning, uh, I would like you to keep that in mind, that it's not just a question of providing for uh, people who can't afford to live here and who are getting priced out of here. Those people are making this town work. We need to remember that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the consent calendar. Do, are there any items for discussion or is there a motion? I shall move. Consent calendar. I have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second. Motion and a second. All those in favor respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. We have no ordinances or public hearings. Moving on to item 3A,
budget study session and how much of this if not all of it did we cover in the previous meeting uh, none of it was covered in the previous perfect meeting. Uh -oh. I, I can't read lips <laughs> Pardon me. Council. It's not, it's, it's okay. Okay, so we are now in the regular um, meeting and we will continue in the theme of budget. As I mentioned with my comments at the six o'clock uh, special meeting, we've got a couple of items that we're trying to cover. We covered the strategic plan um, at six o'clock and because you guys worked so efficiently, we connected the other piece in terms of some interest. So we've got that information from you and I, I very much appreciate that. Um, I wanna remind you that Patrick is here to help us again through this process and help facilitate the discussion so that all of the council can participate fully. Uh, we will have, I'm asking now, our uh, finance director, Yulia Carter, um, and introduce her staff as well, who will provide us some information, um, some financial information, and then a portion of it um, we, we, we've already covered. So we'll go through this as quickly as possible. Good evening. Mr. Mayor, City Council. Well, first of all, I would like to apologize for my voice tonight. I'm getting over the cold and still not quite well. We are doing it a little bit backwards, as you know, but um, <clears throat> in this section of the presentation, we will, I would like to spend a few minutes to talk about budget timeline, uh, budget process and methodology, and then I will turn it into um, to Dennis Jia, who is our senior accountant, um, who will talk about uh, long-term financial outlook and some of his budget assumptions. This table shows where we are in the budget process as of today. We just discussed the outcomes of the strategic uh, uh, retreat that was held back in February. Also, at the last council meeting, City Council approved fiscal year 15-16 mid-year budget adjustments. And today we are having our first uh, budget study session. We already received some valuable input from you. Um, as is which will help us to develop budget options that we'll, we will bring back to you at the next study session in May. Uh, please note that we made some changes in the budget timeline uh, compared to the original timeline that was brought to you back in December. The uh, council meeting originally scheduled for June 7th has been um, canceled and uh, we will be bringing the second study session on May 17th. And finally, on June 21st, the staff will bring the final budget for your formal adoption. Just a few words about the, the budget process itself. This budget process actually started at mid-year budget um, review that was brought to you at the last council meeting. During the mid-year review, we worked with each department uh, to go over the revenues and expenditures projections and uh, throughout the rest of the year, which was a foundation for this current uh, uh, upcoming budget work. And as of today, budget forms and instructions have been already distributed to departments. Over the next few weeks, we will be finalizing the budget recommendations and we will merge them with the council priorities as you discussed earlier today and bring them back as part of recommended budget um, at the second study session in May. The outcomes of the fiscal year 16-17 budget process will be council adoption of the budget document itself, which will include annual operating budget, work programs and narratives for each specific department, and uh, redesigned five-year capital improvement program budget. These are the three major changes to fiscal year 16-17 budget. It's not that scary, but the, the number one is implementation of the modified zero-based budget methodology. We will talk about it in the next few slides in more details. The second one is a redesigned capital improvement uh, program budget that will also be covered later this evening. 
And finally, we will look into and make some changes to internal service funds and uh, personnel allocations. Now I'd like to take a moment to talk a little bit about modified zero-based budget methodology. This silly slide right here uh, shows different approaches to municipal budgeting in general. Uh, most local governments nationwide use some kind of variation of one of these budget methodologies. Incremental budgeting is where we are now, as you can see on the slide. For the most part, we are using incremental budgeting for current fiscal year 15-16, and it is also called traditional budgeting, when a today's funding level is defined and based on the previous year's actuals or previous year's performance, the actual dollar spent. Zero-based budgeting is where we want to be in fiscal year 16-17. And under this methodology, expenses are not assumed just because they took place in the previous year. They must be demonstrated as necessary, again, at the program level or service level. So the decisions that you will be asked to uh, make will be based on the service level rather than just the dollar threshold. Each program is considered in the light of potential alternatives and priorities, as we discussed earlier today, and this will help to achieve more cost-effective delivery of public services. And these are some practical advantages of zero-based budgeting methodology. First of all, it allows for efficient allocation of resources based on needs and benefits rather than just history. Um, it also allows for analysis of alternatives for example, the good example of this would be uh, cost-benefit analysis of uh, in-house versus outsourced services or programs in the city. It would detect inflated budget and uh, will allow uh, to identify and eliminate non-key activities or maybe some redundancies that could exist in the organization when some activities could be covered in different departments. But most importantly, it has a mission focus, as it forces organization to determine its mission and overall goals. It boosts communication and coordination at all levels of organization and creates focused and fiscally disciplined culture. Now, how are we going to accomplish all of that? There are several steps to modify zero-based budgeting methodologies uh, that, that we are going to take. First, we will establish the base budget that will, will reflect the current service level or current program level in the organization. Then, we will develop the base budget and expenditure assumptions. Uh, some examples of this would be personnel, salary and benefit increases, uh, for current provisions of uh, MOUs, some adjustments uh, for inflations and things like that. Dennis will cover some of them in just a few minutes. Uh, we will determine surplus or deficit, and I'm very pleased to report that this year it will be surplus, so that's a very positive news. And then we will develop decision packages for council to consider for service enhancements or reductions. And again, when I say service enhancements and reduction, it is at the service level, whether the new program that we want you to consider or if you want to eliminate the program, if that's the case. After that, departments will rank decision packages based on their priorities, and the city manager will prioritize them citywide to identify those that will be included in fiscal year 16-17 budget that will be presented to you at the next study session. And please keep in mind that these recommendations or these decision packages will be based on many factors, not just the cost. Uh, it will include the city's strategic vision, staffing capacity, and overall impact of the city operations um, and services provided to the community. And with this, I would like to turn this over to Dennis, who will go over some of the base budget assumptions and financial outlook. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, as, you, as Yulia said, my name is Dennis Jaw. I'm a senior accountant here. 
closer, sorry. I'm a senior accountant with this city and it's my honor to be here with you guys tonight. Um, as Yulia said, I'm going to be talking a bit about the uh, assumptions that we will be using uh, going forward from the base budget that she mentioned. Um, I'll start with revenue and especially of note, uh, uh, we have three main- Excuse me, may I ask you to bring the mic about this close? Because uh, it'll, it'll help us a lot. Because every word you say is so important because we don't want to miss any. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is this it, better? It, it can't be too close. Don't worry about, you have to be, eye contact, don't have to worry about the voice we need to hear. Okay, so, Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, as I was saying, the, the city has uh, three main sources, uh, three uh, top sources of revenue that are above all the rest. The first is being uh, transient occupancy tax. It's our number one source of revenue. Um, if you look back to uh, as far as 2010, we've never had a year where um, the r increase in transient occupancy tax has not exceeded uh, has never been lower than 6.9%, at least not back till 2010. So in this year, we will be assuming a 6% increase. We like to be conservative with revenue. It's better to um, give you the news mid-year that we'll be having more revenue instead of having less revenue um, next year. So uh, that's what we'll be using for transient occupancy tax. Uh, the next highest, the second highest source of revenue the city has is the sales and use tax. Um, we uh, contract with Muni Services to give us projections uh, of how um, our sales taxes are looking. Um, we meet with them once every quarter and they provide us with reports. And they have reported to us that they project a 1.5% uh, increase in sales. Uh, however, as you know, the um, Measure J elapsed in, uh, at the end of March 2016. So with the increase in sales, however, we'll be seeing a decrease in uh, overall sales tax revenue as um, that 1.5 million approximately that Measure J brings in uh, will no longer be a part of the fiscal year 16-17 budget. Uh, so we're looking at a decrease of about 37% in overall sales tax revenue when you take Measure J into account. Uh, the third highest uh, revenue source at the city is property tax, and based upon um, county projections and what we've seen in the past, we're going to be assuming a 4% increase. Uh, I will like to make note that um, uh, the, the topic of ERAF, which is the Educational Revenue Augmentation Fund, and um, while we have been receiving that um, in 1617, it was a little bit over $200,000 on an annual basis. Um, the county never gives us uh, any sort of guarantee that we'll be receiving that on, on any given year. So we historically have assumed that that is a one-time cost and we budget for it when we receive it. So overall sales tax um, in the budget, you'll see as being lower than the prior year, although chances are if we do receive the ERAF again, it will continue to increase by about the 4%. And uh, the remaining revenues, um, there are a bunch of others. We'll continue to analyze them based on department feedback, any external sources, whether it be the county or um, any other information that we're able to receive. We'll, we'll continue to do further analysis on, on those to give you, um, to provide an accurate uh, assumption for revenues. Now, we'll look at some uh, of the notable assumptions that we'll be making for general fund expenditures. Uh, the first we'll be looking at is personnel assumptions. Um, we'll take all of the classifications that uh, council has approved in, in addition to what is already um, in existence and uh, we'll take the uh, pension contribution rates as an assumption. Those will be provided to us by CalPERS. Uh, they probably already be, have, but we need to finalize those. Um, salary step increases uh, built into the classifications for any employees that are eligible for it. Um, a 2% cost of living adjustment per each of our MOU contracts uh, that will kick in um, J July 1st of 2016. And uh, this year we'll be including any part-time and overtime funding that has already been approved. And, and for uh, the other expenditures, um, professional services contracts uh, will generally be set, excuse me, at a 3% uh, over the revised budget of 1617. Uh, there will be contracts that will be more or less, uh, and with department feedback, we'll be incorporating uh, any differences as well. And operating expense and capital outlay, we generally set at 2% over the 1617 revised budget. 
Um, I wanted to show uh, council this uh, table again. This was also presented with the mid-year um, budget amendment report that was presented uh, in the last council meeting, just to show, uh, continue to show that we, uh, what the projected fund balances are uh, given the uh, budget amendments that council approved in the mid-year budget process. And um, so as you can see, it, it's, it looks very healthy. Um, I would like to make note that these are not cash balances. They include land, um, capital assets, and other non-spendable assets um, that are associated with that. But for the most part, everything looks um, positive and that we have um, a lot going on here at this city. And uh, again, this, this is also a table that um, was presented with mid-year that we'd like to revisit just to show um, that uh, we have a, a healthy undesignated fund balance despite having the operation contingency that council has um, previously approved of 30% of operating expenses. Um, we have the Main, Main Street Bridge contingencies and uh, the wrap-up of Measure J um, assigned balances, but we still have uh, almost 3.7 million in unassigned fund balances, uh, which is 90% of expenses, and with the ending budget of 90% of expenses, which is well above any um, recommendation by any, any governmental uh, oversight board. And uh, we're, we're looking here now at um, a five-year forecast starting with fiscal year 16-17. Um, these already take into account the elapse of Measure J. Um, because it starts in fiscal year 1617, we don't see the dip from it. But the, uh, for example, the uh, operating revenue in 16, in 1516, excuse me, uh, was at 15.4 for the revised budget. So we see the decrease from that. But after that, um, we're assuming, uh, barring any unforeseen circumstances, that uh, revenues uh, will continue to rise at about a 2% um, is what we're what we're projecting. Uh, the orange column is the uh, operating expenditures. We're also building in about 3% increase uh, every year. And the various shades of blue are the different reserve balances um, that are showing. And just to finish this off, we, um, we already take into account that the fact that uh, the judgment obligation bonds, uh, the, the B bonds will be paid off on August of 2019. And uh, we're also uh, assuming that uh, on, in December of that same year, we'll be beginning the loan repayments for the library. So those are already built into these forecasts. And in summary, uh, the city has very encouraging, positive financial outlook. Um, things look very good from any financial viewpoint. Um, and uh, as Yuli mentioned, we'll be implementing the modified zero bu base budget methodology, will be, which will be new uh, for the fiscal year 1617. Um, we'll be presenting a recommended budget in the council, to the council on May 17th at the study session at that point, and we'll, uh, we'll pr provide for you the formal final uh, budget for 1617 for adoption on June 21st of 2016. Um, and so, uh, before we were going to throw this uh, back to Patrick, but we already covered that part, so we're available for uh, any questions that you may have for, for Yuli and myself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Well done. Uh, any questions or comments from council? Uh, council Member Miller. Yeah, I guess we shouldn't dwell on that, but... Uh, um, I've talked to a number of cities recently, and uh, they were quite shocked that we're the only one lowering our sales tax, unfortunately. And uh, the public has to understand that, uh, you know, we're in the business of providing services. And when you get a cut like that, it, it, it hurts. But um, a friend of ours in what city I won't name, but they have a huge reserve and they increase their sales tax. So they're looking out for the future. So we're a good job if we can't. Look at the past. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment about the, about the, um, I guess the, about sunsetting of Measure J, which is our uh, half cent sales tax. Uh, so we, there's a drop in the revenues, uh, which is pretty substantial. And um, comment on Measure J is that one of the benefits that brought our community is all those funds went to incremental things. It did, they didn't use, we didn't use those monies to pay for 
provide, just paying for services that we were already getting. It all went for net new things for the community. That was a big deal. Um, that I think this is a good time to watch. I think if, if we have a need as a community to fund some other major initiative, that's, we're gonna get through our library project and our other things. If we, if we have a need as a community down the road to fund a major initiative, I think we're gonna see there was a lot of arguments. Just remember this. Karina, you remember this too when you read an article down the road. The, uh, there were a lot of arguments when we raised the sales tax by half cent that, oh my God, no one's gonna come to the coast side because now our sales tax is a half cent higher. And of course that didn't happen. And now it's a half cent lower and people aren't tripping over themselves to come here and, 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 and buy something on the coast. It's, I think it's a pretty modest dynamic. They're very tempered dynamic. So in the future, I think we should be open-minded to very carefully considering this kind of funding should we need it. But I think it's, it's viable and it, I think we did well with it while we had it. So I'll just make that comment. The, I, I have no comments from council on this. Good report, thank you. And I know we had a study session prior to this, so we covered a lot of the next. Yeah, yeah. and you've seen a lot of this with the mid-year that you saw just at the last council meeting. Uh, so thank you. And we will now uh, move on into the um, CIP program. And John Dowdy will walk us through that as well as uh, PACON. So I wanted to say good evening to all the AP Gov students who, who know how to make a graceful exit. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Obviously, they, they must have watched on TV and no one to leave <laughs> when I'm coming up. <laughs> and I'll make sure I speak into the microphone because I know my voice doesn't carry well. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, Council Members, Community. Um, myself, uh, John Dowdy, Community Development Director, along with our new city engineer, Pekan Abasi. So um, tonight I'll just let them sit here and hopefully be grilled a couple times maybe, but, uh, but we'll keep them on the low and the down low um, for this. But I'm thrilled to have them here and I know the community will be as well. So uh, tonight we wanna talk about the five-year capital improvement program and capital budget for 2016-17. Um, we'll touch on a variety of these issues and just walk you through how we came to uh, what's in your packet and hopefully then have um, a, uh, a conversation about whether we hit the mark or whether we need to look at other um, options. So again, um, tonight we're hoping to formalize as much as we possibly can the five-year capital improvement program, the, the list for the five-year as well as to get your direction with regard to year one. Year one is particularly critical because we can't build the budget for the May study session without knowing um, pretty much where you're standing uh, with regard to the expenditures and the projects. So um, I'll be brief, but I think it's important just to walk through um, a little bit of the background of what it is, what it is and, um, and why we do this in terms of capital improvement. Um, obviously, there are a lot of needs and issues within any community um, in this country. We have a lot of deteriorating infrastructure. We build a lot um, during various times when public funds were readily available. And over the last 30, 40 years, those funds have become increasingly not available um, from the sources they used to be. Um, the CIP is um, part of the financial planning process and it is really a prioritization tool. So it's important that, um, that this process occur within both the community as well as at the council level. Um, we're talking about capital improvement projects there of uh, a fairly large scale. We usually look at 30,000 being sort of the threshold point between maintenance or a small project. We talked about that a little earlier. Um, and they're very permanent in nature and generally they're non-recurring. Um, the capital budget itself is really the first year, one year um, of the budget process, which you allocate then funds for specifically for those projects. And so it doesn't include um, necessarily years two, three, four, and five. 
um, but we are looking at as we move forward with um, sort of the new CIP model of really looking at programming out and trying to look at down the road what that funding looks like beyond the one year point so we can be strategic about those and understand that when you commit to a three year project, hopefully there's money at the third year to finish the project. So um, that's good government, I think. Um, from a funding perspective, the city has taken a general, um, has historically used a pay-as-you-go method, um, not a lot of bonding for programs or specific projects for the most part, um, and we've looked at deferred improvement um, being part of, unfortunately, sometimes the, um, the CIP rather than as part of the operating budgets, and so part of the uh, what we're hoping to evolve this point is to look more at the operating budgets actually dealing with the operating budgets and maintenance rather than just as a uh, point of the CIP so we can kind of distinguish those. Um, part of what again we're looking at from this perspective is to try to um, be more strategic and bring that forward and look at extending the planning horizon hopefully into more of a 10-year um, snapshot so we can really look at what the needs are, look at what our capital replacement needs are. Part of the challenge is, is the complete useful life cycle analysis. So we know that 10, 20 years down the road we need to replace certain infrastructure or certain projects, this building um, or any number of uh, buildings um, or, or, or um, infrastructure that we need to deal with. And I was thrilled to hear um, your comments regarding the master planning efforts and issues with that deal, because those are critical for us to be able to set um, impact fees as well as to identify the CIP needs. And so those are included within this process. And then finally, um, just getting into this year's process, um, this is, I think, was an um, exceptionally um, good and inter, you know in, in process in terms of pri prioritization, and it's the best one that I've been involved in, um, really from the perspective of both staff-wise. I think getting engaged in this early um, and often, unfortunately, I think for them they say often, um, and then also getting the community input as well as council input and allowing this to churn through, and and work through um, identifying. I think um, a list that that um, at least is the start of making sense. And again, uh, we did this in-house, a lot of work was done. We presented um, a sort of a master list of, of the potential projects to the community in January. And then at your um, annual retreat, we came and presented sort of that list. Um, at the annual retreat, um, you identified some needs to identify the projects more clearly to clearly um, identify more of the cost um, and some of the aspects of how long these things go on. It was a very good process because it allowed us to narrow down um, those projects and understand those projects better ourselves. It also, um, you also identified some other projects which we talked about earlier in the study session. So those were added into the list and that was um, a very beneficial for us to get an early understanding of some of your priorities and issues and needs. Um, and it also allowed us to sort of look through um, as we prioritized and, and looked at those things um, to be able to sort of understand a little more clearly what the council um, in general is looking at from, from that perspective. One of the keys I think this year as opposed to some um, maybe the last two years in particular that I'm more familiar with is that we carved out the eight routine and mandatory programs that are out there that are pretty uh, generally funded not by general fund for the most part but by um, um, enterprise funds not all but for the most part they're enterprise funds the sewer um, and some of the ongoing uh, routine projects and carve those out and pretty much have said at least our recommendation is these are part of every year's work what we ultimately fund um, is your choice, is your decision, but for the most part we've identified what we think is sort of the minimum funding level for each um, year that we should start with and then sort of work from there. So, um, and I don't expect you to, to be able to actually look um, <laughs> through this from this perspective, but um, the council was asked to individually provide your input on prioritization of the projects. Um, you did two things, you did um, a one, through 28 ranking, and then you also did an ABC uh, prioritization. So you had eight A's, 10 B's, and 10 C's, 
28 projects that were on that list. On the screen is basically the, uh, is the run through of what the A, B, and C prioritization looked like. And on the right, you'll see uh, we put a numeric value, five, three, and one, A's being five, uh, B's being three and um, C's being one, just to get some distinction between those and went through that process. So um, these were not, um, the, the results were not horribly surprising from what you had indicated individually and as a group priorities and prioritization was uh, prior to that. And what I can say is, well, I'm not gonna show you the, the rankings. These were confirmed really with the ranking, the rank order one through 28. There's so much variability, though, in the one through 28s that it's you know that it was it was a good process, um, but but um, this was really a cleaner way to look at what your priorities were. But clearly, when we looked at it and analyzed it, there were similarities, and they were very much aligned with what you see under the ABC. So there was no surprises either way. There was just more variability. So, what did we do with that? Staff took. Ultimately, that list prepared the list, and we, um, as a group, identified evaluation criteria for working um, through these. And I won't go through these individually, but one of those that we felt was important, um, among all of these being important, I'll take bullet point three, is, is part of that was that the project is a follow-on to prior completed work. Um, and so that was sort of one of those where it says, um, you know, if we've committed uh, monies and we're developing this, and, and I'll use, for example, why um, in the list the, um, ma the storm drain master plan kind of rose to that point is we're already in phase one. We really feel that it's critical to move to phase two, um, and then we can work toward actually identification and working through projects. That's our thought process, what we kind of put to that point. The other was, I, th I think, even um, is bullet point two on there is work on the project has commenced and significant expenditures have already been made. So that's identifying that we're already, the horse is out of the barn, so to speak. We've spent money as a, as a city and um, let's finish the work that we've done. Obviously, if, if there's a desire to, to change direction or to do that, that's also um, an opportunity um, for that. What we then did was um, take a look at what project management needs were. Um, it, it, you know, and, and let me just um, preface this by saying, from staff's perspective, this is the good stuff. We love the CIP, we love doing projects, we love building things. Um, I think all of us enjoyed being in the dirt pile as a kid and, um, and playing with the Tonka trucks and seeing things happen and, and, and whether that's pipes in the ground or whether that's new parks or, or improving the streets and making them more passable or whatever those may be. But there's a limit to what we um, can do, what we believe that we can achieve and su be successful at. And I think the critical piece to this is, is that we were not, we, while we were successful at at, at developing and, and ultimately delivering on some projects this year, this 15, 16 year, we feel like we overcommitted a bit um, in the last CIP or in the current CIP, and we need to be clear that, that, that what that means. So we went through a very um, extensive analysis um, of that and used a, basically an FTE analysis to get to that point and went down to point one FTE looking at what that means. And just from a perspective of that, a point one FTE is basically equivalent to three and a half hours a week um, on a project. So if you think of that in terms of a phone call, um, person at the counter, um, a meeting, uh, working on invoices and budgeting, it isn't a lot of time. It gets three and a half hours, gets taken up pretty quickly in a week. And obviously no project is nicely balanced with three and a half hours per week. What it means is that some weeks it's 20 hours and some weeks it's 20 hours and some weeks it's one hour. Um, so that's uh, also a challenge with that. So what did we um, ultimately arrive at um, from the recommended project list? And these are just parsed out from the list that you have in your packet um, to make it a little easier. So the, the first slide here um, are the, 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 the pinkish, uh, reddish, whatever, whatever you want to call that, um, more of a red. Um, and those are the routine and mandatory projects and programs. There were eight of those 
that we um, that we put forth and priced those and costed those out. And those again were assumed in this scenario to be assumed as being in and roughly funded at, at this point and not part of prioritization. Your next slide um, covers the um, green area, um, which is in your list, the fiscal year 1617 list of projects. That would be if, if everything was, um, was okay tonight and you said go forward, this would be along with the prior slide, your capital um, budget for fiscal year 1617. Now what you will see is um, not all of the prioritized projects are on this list um, from your process. We recognize that and acknowledge that, and that's part of the process tonight of discussing um, how we approach that and, and whether, that, um, whether some of those are brought forth. And, um, and certainly that's what the conversation is tonight. But this was from our perspective, from using those criteria and analyzing what we felt using both outside consultant assistance, existing staffing, and looking at managing that um, whole program was what we could recommend to you. And I struggled with this, staff struggled with this. Um, frankly, there were projects that are in year two here that were in year one initially, and I couldn't um, recommend to the city manager in good faith to put those into year one um, with, with what we had in place and what we thought we could handle without some significant discussion from the council about what we do um, and whether we look at structural changes in the way the, 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 the department's um, broken out and how we approach those issues. So those were fairly significant issues and why those come. So again, uh, this list is your year two and I think there are um, almost all of those projects were in your list um, of highly prioritized projects. And, um, and the, the nice thing about many of those projects in year two is that they are one year. Um, a majority of those are one year projects. Some of them extend into year two and some year um, you're either extending beyond that point. And then ultimately um, year three. Again, each one of these years that we look at includes the eight mandatory or routine projects. So this isn't the entire list, it's the pink list that's right at the top of that is added to each one of these. So in terms of staffing, in terms of um, managing those projects and programs, they all keep cumulatively including those eight projects year by year by year. Um, the other thing that, that I uh, probably didn't mention adequately, um, but if you look at the way these tables were set up, it shows you where you're going to have multiple year uh, projects and most of the projects are multiple year projects so you have to look at design you look at a bid and construction drawings and and bidding process award a bid and sometimes you're looking at even a third year at where you start construction because it's not the right time of year in terms of timing so we're looking at timing how you move forward with these the other thing is is that in any given year we're not likely to start every single project at July 1 you will work and work through those issues and you'll start some around July 1 and some you'll start later on in mid-year or even into the, the last quarter of the year. Um, so you stagger those around and kind of work through that. So there's a, there is a process and so um, we've tried to look at that and identify how we could work through some of those issues as we deal with project management and those costs. The other thing um, that comes out of this issue is the other soft cost beyond the issue of just the project management, whether it's um, consultant or, or staff driven, is what finance can handle, what legal can handle, and there's the whole other side of administrative support that comes with that. Years four and five clearly um, are not as well identified. We just really were having so much focus on years one, two, and three, frankly, that um, we'll, we'll have to vet this more and deal with it, but it's a start and it's a start of looking longer for that. So, um, for a beginning point, um, this represents our recommended capital budget for fiscal year 2016-17 um, for a starting point for discussion. 
Thank you. So I bring it back to council for questions, comments. Um, I, I have a question. My question is, I need to understand, my question always starts with a statement, so I apologize. So I need to understand the dynamics of this, that if an item were to be recommended to move up from year two to year one, uh, or some other year to year one, does that structurally require that an item move from year one off? Like, what, what how, how, how taut is the rubber band, is my question. Yeah. Well, it's a very good question, and I, I will, I just will um, echo and emphasize the comments that John made. We really struggled over this and tried to make sure that we are not over-promising and under-delivering, which I think is what we've done historically for good reason, because we want to do what the council is asking us to do and what the community needs. Uh, so ideally, yes, we would love to have, if you want to, it's going to move up, then something should move down. Uh, it's not a one-for-one one necessarily, because it depends on the project. Some projects maybe are multi-year, some projects can, as John mentioned, can start later in the year. Uh, but certainly we'd like to hear those comments. Um, it may also mean, uh, so, so we'd like to hear there's some other staffing issues that go along with that. Um, so depending on what they are and how many or if they are or not, um, we can answer that question a little bit better. Got it, thank you. So I'll, I'll turn it over to council after I make one comment uh, about moving things up and down. Is I have an observation about the year one projects. Uh, and it's a bit of my philosophy about, about the things I try to bring to the community, and that is um, I always like to see uh, an example of, of a, a, you might call it a quick win or something small or modest that is an observable sign of, oh, our community is a nice place to live and it's getting better. An example would be the electric vehicle charging station. That was like an 11th hour item we added to the budget a few years ago. Not terribly expensive, um, but it sent a message. It said, oh, this is something modern. It's, it's something new for the community. People benefit from it. Marketing-wise, it put us on the map, on, 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 these, on the green maps of where you can charge a vehicle. Uh, and it, I would call that a quick win. Not, not an overnight project, um, but something that, that when it went up, like, oh, there's something new for our community. And one observation I have is when we look at our year one projects, there's a lot of great stuff there. I might make a suggestion after I hear other comments that there might be something small, one or two small things that we move up and maybe rejuggle some things so that in the coming year, uh, we're gonna have a major construction with the library. Uh, would be nice to also have something like just start and start and get done and people can say, oh, hey, that's a new thing we have here. So, and I have a couple ideas, but um, I'd like to hear other comments from the council. I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, a little bit different approach from the pretty feel good, make our visitors feel good. I don't think uh, there's anything more important till you really don't have it. And I really appreciate the maintenance on the sewer systems. I, I think this is, there's four items there that are huge costs, but I think that's something nobody even thinks about. Nobody feels and gets to understand it. But let me tell you, when it's not there, we're gonna sure as hell hear about it. So I think those are very important, but I agree with you. We like those visual feel good things, but we have the responsibility to ensure our infrastructure continues to get improved. That's my opinion on some of those. And infrastructures are sewer and streets and those types of things. So thank you. Noted. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that we that we neglect our infrastructure. I'm suggesting that we are aware, we maintain uh, our awareness of public perceptions of the community that people live in. Other comments, questions? My question is on on street repair, and maybe it's not in this because maybe it's already part of another plan in all the streets. Um, is it a part of another plan in all the streets? Um, so downtown, there's a couple of streets. Um, I think it's Grove and Metzger and Magnolia just going down there. They're horrible. I mean, I even hate riding my bike over those. They're that bad. Um, is that part of a plan? And then also, um, I don't know if it's in there, but Balboa. 
Balboa is down off of Kelly, and that's been a gravel road that's not been touched. And now it's beyond potholes of filling gravel in there because the fiat that goes down there gets swallowed up by the hole in there. Um, is that on a list either for gravel or maybe we pave it for once in 100 years? I was thankful that when Alex and I went out to take a look at Balboa. We were in his truck, so it wasn't quite as bad. We didn't lose we didn't lose our truck in the holes, but um, it's pretty significant. Um, I on a, you you raised that at a, at a at another time, and we need to look at what our role is. I'm not sure ownership, but we can we can deal with that. But let me hit on the rest of that. Um, in the pink box are the uh, is uh, let's see here is the pavement management item number four. And um, what we're proposing is a, it's a pretty modest amount of money in there. And the reason why uh, is that what we really feel we need to do is do the design work on multiple streets that we can then uh, prioritize the following year for the actual construction work. Um, some years we're lucky, we are in some ways, we talked about it, it's like uh, Magda and I, is the drought lucky? Well, from a construction wise it is, but um, from, I think, from everybody else, the perspective is no, it's not good. This year, for example, we awarded bid for Washington and, um, um, and Ventura and got caught uh, with the weather. And we started Ventura, really hesitated to start it, but we did it, we thought we could get it done, and it's been a mess for those poor neighbors. We did not want to get caught in that situation, and so what this accounts for in this fiscal year is for design. Magnolia is on that list. Miramontes uh, point, the finishing up um, the westerly point, so we access um, to the access drive for Kenyatta, um, Kenyatta Verde, or the mobile home park. Kanata Cove, sorry, I know the stairs. Um, Kanata Cove, so that's part of that. There's a number of streets that are in that list that we want to design and then come back and deal with it. If in fact um, we can get those designed in a timely, in a more timely manner than than um, than we have historically, um, and we can get those into a bidding mode, then we can come back and ask the council to. Um, allocate additional funds for the actual construction and moving it up and moving it forward and um, we certainly are open to that. But um, there are those and we can certainly uh, provide that list of the, of the priorities. Church is one of those, Magnolia. There are several um, out there. I think Grand um, is one that's, um, you know, I, we can hit most of people's highlights um, for those. <laughs> The mayor, I, I, I really believe, you know, uh, we council members have our priorities in order when our constituents raise heck with us, you know. So uh, the other one, and uh, we all see it, it's not too far from home there, but uh, the east end of Miramonte Street. Uh, and I look at that as a potential parking area, too, if it was able to be passable uh, for the future. I mean, there's, there's spots down there we could park. So that's just a little extra boost for it there and uh, get some of the neighbors off of uh, my neighborhood back. If, if that starts to resemble a recommendation, I think that's certainly something that when we look at that four, year four and five particularly is an easy one to put on the horizon out there and say let's start looking at that and scoping that and working through that and costing it. So that's, that's what we're looking for tonight. Thank you. Councilmember Penrose. Yeah, a couple of items uh, that are in the orange box. I think it's orange. I don't know, where is it? I know, what page is the way to do this? Page 16. Um, feel good projects. Uh, we have been hearing with our general plan update numerous times about community gardens and bike and pedestrian bike and pedestrian plan. Um, I think if we moved those up and made them a priority, neither of them are horribly expensive. I don't know what they include in terms of staff time, but I would like to see them prioritized. And <laughs> Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor, comments? Turn yourself off. 
I did? Okay. I'd like to say thank you to staff for um, a great planning document. Uh, it's, yeah, it's really well done. I can tell there's a lot of work in this. And it's very rational, year one, year two, year three distribution, um, very, very rational. Uh, I can understand pretty much why everything is, is there. A lot of thought went into it. Um, I do agree that it would be nice to have some um, feel-good projects, and I'd like to throw out a recommendation for your consideration, and that is um, that we maybe, well, we'll see how it works, but maybe start a tradition of one project that's the mayor's choice. Oh, this is a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know. know. We, we need to put some boundaries around it, not something that's hugely expensive, right? But something that's, that's visible, that's, you know, really meaningful to you. But then we have a second project where the remainder of us, the four of us, you know, put in our preferred project and then we draw one from the hat. So that we have one mayor's choice and then we have, you know, the wild card. And... Uh, I have a comment about that. Um, and not because I'm the mayor, but but truly, even if I wasn't, it, that's fun, right? And it also, it also allows the, uh, the council to, you know, when you, when you get the position of mayor, which we all will and all do, that uh, you can kind of be the champion. And it, it's, sort of, it's sort of analogous to something I, I thought about doing previously, which is um, I thought about, um, um, during the election year, to having every council member sort of champion, championing one thing every year. Uh, and this is sort of in, in, in that spirit. So I, I do like that. Um, and if I pick something really stupid, you're just going to kick me under the table. But uh -huh. uh, I would support You'll that. You'll get two chances yeah. to approach yeah. <laughs> uh, Councilman Muller. Yeah, just to, to uh, pounce on that one there. I didn't, I didn't see that in my <laughs> ethics training the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, but I guess the, we have to be careful there, right, uh, City Clerk? <laughs> so, 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 is, is there a momentum for that 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 sort of approach? Is there? I don't think I don't think it's about us. It's a, it's about the projects for the community, and I think we're going to get ourselves in a whole lot of trouble. Really? Yeah. I, I do. I don't, I, so let's, what, what's the trouble? So let's, let, yeah, let's say, let's say Marina, hypothetically, you're mayor and you pick extending the Naomi Patrick's Trail as the thing that you want to make a priority in your year and you've moved it from year two to year one. Uh, how would that, does that create any controversy or any risk? Well, I, I think we're setting priorities. I mean, that's a fun, that's a fun idea to think about. But I, I think we've already established priorities, what we can, if there's money available. You know, whether people champion it or not, I think you, could, you always have the ability to champion anything you're interested in. And, and I think we do that. I think you've done that in the past. So I don't know that specifically this is the mayor's project. I mean, you can do that with the f scholarship money you give out. There's all, there's all kinds of different things, but it's not about championing something just because it's this one thing. I think there's a whole lot of really great things that we can all champion where our interests are. <laughs> there, was, there was this Saturday Night Live, what was this Saturday Night Live uh, skit, the Debbie Downer, as I'm thinking of? It's like Snoopy. Wah. Wah. So, uh, all right, well, I don't know. If there, is there, I don't know if there's momentum for it. I think it's a great idea because I think it makes it fun and, 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 and I don't think that, we're not a fall of any principles or any rule. Uh, it also, um, you know, with, when you're sitting on council for two or three years and you become the mayor, then you get to say, hey, I'll, I really think it's important that we do X. So, um, but if there's not momentum, then there's not momentum, but I would support that. So are there, are there any, rec uh, thank you, Councilmember Penrose, for your recommended um, items to move. I. I still like that idea, by the way, and so if, if anybody wants to revive it, that's good. I would make a recommendation to move a project, um, and because whether it's feel good, we call it feel good, it's visible signs of progress in our community is good for the spirit of our community. Um, and as I look at the year two projects, 
and only because I think my flagpole idea for Macduchie Park is, is under the $30,000 threshold, I would recommend that we um, uh, move up the uh, item number 26, the Smithfield Tot Lot and T-Ball Field. Uh, and were that project to happen this calendar year would be uh, pretty spectacular. If that is not a quick win, so if that is not a quick, not quick, not, it would, if it couldn't start and stop in the same year, start and finish, the same, that, then I'd say that's not a candidate because it doesn't meet that sort of criteria. May I make a suggestion? Um, given the conversation, we could, and my staff might kill me here, but we could potentially separate the Smithfield tot lot from the ball field. The ball field is the heavy duty one, the tot lot is not. If the interest is around the tot lot, we could potentially move that up um, and leave the ball field separate. I think that would make sense. And then and I think we, we have identified that one in our previous discussions as being both a, um, a positive thing, but then also a safety issue. Uh, and then, then the remaining project r the r could, could remain as a year two thing. I think that's a good idea. Other momentum, uh, I know uh, Councilmember Penrose brought up some items and uh, I yeah, hear some momentum on that, but any other discussion? I'd like to go that? back to that a little bit. Just um, one of the things that we're supposed to be doing is responding to the community. And I do think there has been an awful lot of talk during our general plan uh, update process about um, the lack of walkability and rideability for our bicycle. And that is a one-year project. It's not that expensive. Um, it's, I'd like to see that moved up. And, and when I say feel good, what, what I'm really talking about is being more responsive to what the community has said they'd like to see. I mean, obviously they can't make a decision about all of our priorities, but that is one item that would be simple to do. And the other being the community garden assessment that you know, so many people have talked about. May I ask a question of clarification? Sure. Which, for the, uh, the bicycle and pedestrian master plan, uh, is, that a is the result of that a document? Or is the result of that changes, uh, physical visible changes? Can you have someone comment on that, on the mic? The yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, it would be a document with the objective of identifying priorities and strategies for implementation. So, and, and Magda may kill me, but um, I, I think we, this is one where um, it, 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 it it's less engineering related um, project management and, and um, I believe it's something that we could absorb into um, existing staffing and work program um, to do that. So if I can summarize, and I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that staff plan that before anything moves up the list, you have to preface that by, oh, I think John's gonna kill me, because anyway, that seems to be the trend, or I think Magda's <laughs> gonna kill me. So I get it, okay, it's all hard, we understand. Uh, so I'm hearing potential momentum for two things. Uh, the tot lot minus the ball field, and the ball field would be year two, and uh, bicycle uh, pedestrian master plan. Um, I'm not hearing momentum on community garden, unless there is some other comments on that. Uh, I, I'm, so I don't have momentum for that personally, but any other comments on that? Um, I, I think year two is fine. It is, remains a priority. I don't think it would take that much effort. It's just, you know, is there city-owned property, you know, with water hookup that could accommodate it? Um, it might not even have to be city-owned land. You know, perhaps it could be going to post and saying, you know, could we lease, you know, an acre of land for a community garden? So um, I'm not even sure that we, we have to, you know, spend a lot of time and money on it. So I'm not quite sure why we would have to postpone it. Um, but that's... A uh, I, 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 I'm not sure if you're articulating or suggesting it stays in year two, but one thing, as you know, we had the NET program, and we provided our participants a list of 140 things that they could do to build community, and one of them was to create a community garden. So as we continue to try to engage those residents, this is one that I have an interest in trying to say, okay, folks, you might have a space, you might have a location, and how can you, as your community members, get together as a project, perhaps, that this this group can do as a graduation project can work together and identify a space and try to figure out how to create a community garden because you're right it does not have to be sponsored by a city it doesn't have to be city-owned land it doesn't have to, all of that can happen 
by the community, thus the name Community Garden. Okay, so then that, that, so it's possible to put energy behind facilitating that happening without it being a city-funded, managed thing. Right okay, that's I, I would support that. Maybe even on my private property. And, and um, uh, Council Member Muller is volunteering to mentor uh, the would-be growers. I, I do think the parks, uh, excuse me, the bicycle and pedestrian master plan is important for all the reasons that the park and rec master plan is important. We want to be able to position ourselves for grant funding. And, you know, if we wait until the economy is down, a lot of that grant funding is going to be, you know, super competitive and go pretty quickly. So. I think positioning ourselves is really, really important. Great. Are there any other items to bring up, or can I summarize? I, I'm hearing momentum for, I'm hearing a little bit of momentum for letting the mayor pick a project, <laughs> um, but not a lot. Um, but momentum for separating the tot lot from the t-ball field, uh, tot lot year one, t-ball field year two, um, that the, uh, the one? Oh, a bike and pedestrian master plan and then uh, coordination uh, for community garden activities, not necessarily uh, ownership, sponsorship, management up thereof. Okay. okay good. Any other items um, coming up? No. Nope. So I want to acknowledge staff's work on this because it's, it's, it's really tremendous. Uh, this is not necessarily, you know, herding cats, working with the city council with all of our diverse opinions. It's like in herding insane drunk cats, and um, it's really difficult, and we, you got this in order and organized in a really compelling, clear way. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Councilmember Muller. Yeah, I think uh, we've talked about killing, we've talked about drunk cats, but uh, I want to uh, Thank, uh, I'm, I'm a big supporter of the CIP because they have the staples on the proper side and the pages are uh, numbered and I think that's a real plus, so thank you for that. Councilman Pemrose and I like the staples on the left, friends. <laughs> I don't know whose uh, idea sorry, to uh, put them on the right. <laughs> Councilmember Muller, this is the mayor's prerogative of where we staple the packets, and you were never going to see staples on the left again. No. Um, uh, Look at that. And I assume the city manager, John, that this concludes this item, yeah, which we need. Uh, if, I, if I may, Mayor, just again to echo your comments, and I really want to thank staff. Um, I was getting notes from John, Danielle, and others, uh, 10 o'clock at night, weekends, and we've had probably 25 versions of this document and have really tried to incorporate your comments and your interests, and so uh, I, I appreciate your comments towards staff. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and now moving on to the final item of the evening, item 3D, uh, design, consideration of design of Sewer Authority mid Sites Recycled Water Facility. Uh, this is an item continued from a previous meeting because we thought it would be important to have uh, a full council present for that, uh, that discussion and decision. And uh, we have special guest Vivian Hausen, our, our sewer uh, consultant, sitting in today. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Alex Kojikin, Deputy City Manager. Uh, this evening, this evening uh, just as the mayor stated, we are bringing back the item of uh, the SAM Recycle Water Facility pre Preliminary Design. Uh, with me this evening is our uh, city sewer engineer, Vivian Housen, who's been working with us for about the last two years. And so she's going to run us through this presentation, and uh, both Vivian and myself will be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. When I go to dinner with my friends, they ask me what I do, and I tell them I'm a sewer engineer. <laughs> okay, so this presentation is um, the same presentation that was made at the last board meeting, or council meeting, sorry. Um, and we're repeating it today uh, because the item has been continued, and there wasn't uh, much discussion on that, and, and a lot has probably happened since the last council meeting um, for all of you. Uh, this item is related to a request by Sewer Authority mid -Coast side uh, that its member agencies approve a 25% design project for a recycled water facility. 
Um, highlights from the uh, request. Uh, the SAM wishes to produce recycled water to serve a single customer, the Ocean Colony Golf Course. Uh, they have completed a number of studies, 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2015. Um, all of those studies evaluated the cost of recycled water. The 2008 study evaluated technologies. Between 2008 and 2009, a technology was selected, and that same technology is carried through the 2009, 10, and 15 reports. Um, the next step, which is the 25% design, will further define the project. Um, the uh, Sewer Authority Mid-Coast side would like to further define the project in anticipation of submitting a grant application to try to help fund the project. The total cost for the 25% design is 185,562. And the city's portion would be 51% of that, which is 92,597. Uh, the, the next line is not quite correct. Uh, Granada has approved the project, but I understand that Montera has conditionally approved the budget uh, pending the decision from this council. What's 25% mean? Uh, it's the level of design, so they would uh, further develop the actual facilities that are needed, do more technical studies, come up with uh, a basis that they can actually move forward with design that has assurance that, that, what, that what is um, involved in that design. Yeah, uh, so 25, if I may clarify also, a 25% design is a preliminary design, is an early design with 25% confidence in the direction that is the basis needed for moving forward. You get that far, you know a little bit about a lot, and it allows you to then say, well, what kind of funding do we need? How do we... How, it's basically, you, you do the project in increments, so you go a part of the way. Is that accurate, Vivian? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, the city staff have reviewed the various studies, including the most recent study and recommendation, and there, we do have some concerns about cost and process. Uh, we do understand the importance of recycled water and support recycled water in the community. It's a very, very important um, concept and approach and um, do recommend budget approval. However, there are some comp components of the studies that we would also recommend uh, be considered by the council. Um, so the, the primary recommendation is, uh, along with the 25% design, that Sewer Authority mid -Coast side prepare a business plan. And the reason is because there are uh, a lot of unknowns in the information that's been pre presented so far including whether the, the project is financially viable, which is one of the most important considerations in implementing this project. Uh, the business plan, the recommended components of the business plan uh, include a capital cost discussion, an operations and maintenance cost analysis, which has been touched on in some of the reports but not fully vetted. Um, the cost and conditions for use of SAM facilities, there's a recommendation, actually the pro project is predicated on the use of existing SAM facilities for dry weather storage, um, but there's no discussion of rent or of risk to SAM if these facilities are taken out of wastewater service. Uh, the co cost for potable water purchase, uh, the, the technology that's recommended currently for the recycled water plant does not remove, sufficiently remove salts also known as total dissolved solids, but, but more typically referred to as salts. Um, as a result, and actually what was demonstrated through the pilot test, that the salts in the water, if they are used uh, for irrigation without any potable water cleansing, they, they do burn the grass, and so the golf course would need to also purchase potable water and flush the system of salts, and also flush the grasses of salts um, throughout the period that recycled water is used. And I, we didn't see an analysis of the cost of that. Uh, also a plan, uh, included in the business plan would be uh, a plan to address the risk of interruption in recycled water deliveries. If SAM should require to use its own facilities for wastewater treatment during that time, instead of violating, uh, we would expect that SAM would utilize its facilities first and, and stop the production of recycled water. If SAM were to do that, what does that look like in the big picture when water is not being provided to the customer? Is there additional cost? 
are there agreements that have to be um, addressed. So those are the issues that we do not see um, vetted in the existing documents, uh, but they can be part of the 25% design if they're, and they'll be more clearly communicated if they're in a single business plan that's presented along with the findings of the 25% design. And I think the big question would be, if you take the cost of all of this and the risk, is it less than what is available um, from Ocean Colony partners? Ocean Colony partners have a, a, a fixed amount that they can contribute to the project. So when you look at the net present value, you look at the annual cost of this um, facility, uh, is, it, is it something that Ocean Colony partners can afford? Being the sole customer, I think it's important that that question be answered. Um, this table summarizes the different costs and the reason why we're not clear about what the cost of the project would be. As you can see, going from left to right for the reports from 2008 to 2015, the costs have changed. Uh, 2009, 10, and 2015 were for the same facility. So uh, even for the same facility, we're seeing costs change. And uh, what is a little confusing is that the costs have decreased over time. And typically, when you do studies over time, costs increase because you're looking at um, the cost of living and also getting more and more information about your project. And so the question is, are these costs real? Are they complete? Um, and part of that, that would be one of the components of the business plan. Um, so this is just more detail about what I just went through. I don't think I need to go through it again unless anyone has questions on the different components that we uh, would like to see in the business plan. And um, what, what we would recommend is that when the 25% design is completed and the document is, is presented, um, if the business plan is also prepared with the same document, um, that would be the first step. But we also believe that the member agencies um, should understand and agree to the level of risk that's defined in, in the business plan, and that Coastside County Water District also provide their written endorsement of the components. So having the document is the first step, and then receiving um, acceptance of the document would be the next step. And so with that, the staff recommendation is to approve the budget for the 25% design of the SAM Recycled Water Facility, and that would be 92597 but included in that approval um, request that SAM prepare a business plan and define the components that are desired in that business plan and include um, a request that SAM receive endorsement of the business plan from the water district, including con confirmation that they would like to continue to be, be a partner in the project. Thank you. I'd like to bring it back to council with uh, any, any questions or discussion. Um, I have some, but I'll hold mine. Uh, council members? Council, Mayor, I'm sorry, Council Member Muller. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have some very strong concerns about this, to be very honest with you, with all respect to our, our representatives on SAM. Um, in the Bay Area, I believe there's about 40 to 43 nine Bay Area counties that, that are in the business of wastewater uh, treatment. And I think there's about 25 that are actually treating uh, right now. Uh, and along that line, I would first off, before I get into a little more criticism, I would highly recommend that the SAM board and professional staff visit one or two of these plants that are treating water to actually see what the process is, what works, and what does not work, because the technology is changing daily. And I mentioned last meeting, uh, some of us were not here, but uh, the footprint. And I can tell you, uh, last Wednesday's uh, uh, board meeting in Oakland, we had the city of Calistoga on the agenda. And if you look at the amount of storage they have for their ponds out there, I mean, you're talking 10 million gallon three or two 10 million gallon storage ponds. And also they own large irrigation fields where if the customer is not uh, taking the water. Uh, and at one time, speaking of that, they were always looking at just delivering the water free. Uh, 
there is some concerns out in, in the recycled water world about the municipal water districts are concerned because their, their sales of potable water are going down. And so their budget process is being impacted by it. But I'd like to uh, you know, share this and give this to our uh, chair of the uh, SAM board. And also, uh, you know, Calistoga is about 5,100 residents. And I don't mean to dwell on it, but they get about 1,500 visitors a day. And so uh, they treat about 0.85 million gallons. So I'm really concerned about the process. And I think it was brought up that, uh, you know, uh, the budget goes down. I don't, you know, that that is not a, I don't think a fair statement. I think the process, it's, it's going up constantly. So that one is there. And also uh, Petaluma is doing a great job with their recycling facility. And so I just really, I'm not comfortable and I, I'm 100% in support of recycled water. But I think the city of Half Moon Bay and the ratepayers better look very carefully at this because I don't want to see good money poured down a, a, a hole that's not going to show a return to the ratepayers in the city of Half Moon Bay. And I, I don't mean to dwell on that, but I think it's very important. But I think the SAM board and the professionals between the agencies need to get out and see some of these plants and see if it would really work here and the customer, potential customer. Because it's not just about treating water, it's about delivering a quality product consistently. And it's a little bit of a complex deal with uh, us because we have a water district and, and we're not the, the, the agency that uh, delivers the water. And that's, you know, we're not East Bay Mud or City of Calistoga or City of Petaluma or whatever. So I think I highly recommend uh, I have a hard time voting for this personally, but uh, I understand the staff's recommendation. I think we have some uh, protection in this because we need to see exactly what their plans are and not just give a large sum of money out there. And possibly when they do that, we can get this uh, board members out there to see what would really works and what does not work. Thank you for excellent comments, and thank you for those examples. I would love to deliver those to the chair of SAM. They're delivered. Uh, any other comments from city council? Vice Mayor? I think these are really prudent recommendations based on my experience so far with, with the process. I do know that there's some hesitancy on the part of CCWD. Um, it seems to me like the, the sole customer is, is ready to, to jump in if, you know, we can produce that, that product that meets their, their objectives. <clears throat> but I think this gives us some protections. I do think that we should specify that the business plan is actually task one. So, like, not do the design and then do the business plan based on it. But I think we should start with the business plan. I don't know how you feel about that, but... I think differently. Um, I think, well, similarly, I meaning I think we should do the business plan and then with that understanding in mind, decide if we should, we should do the business plan first, yeah. basically. And not, not, not in parallel, but first. I agree. And then, and then, then design other things. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I have a question about Currently, the, the direction to staff is for Sam to prepare the business plan, but it seems to me that we don't want it to be farmed out as part of the consultant contract, that we probably want an independent consultant to prepare a business plan. If I can comment on that. Um, I'm both an engineer and a business consultant, and I understand that engineering consultants are good at doing engineering things. Business consultants sometimes are good at doing business things, and rarely are they the same animal. Um, and so I would feel really strongly that um, not, not just SAM staff, but SAM staff are contributors to a business plan, 
but that a business plan is developed by a business advisor who has done a business plan before and understands the economic issues and is not sort of putting together common sense, but is putting together a fact-based, economic-based business plan. I totally agree. The SAM board is on fire tonight. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, our representative. So I, I, so I think that makes sense. Are you done with your comments? I have a couple of comments. I'll give some more. Yeah, I'm done except I'd like to say that um, I understand uh, Councilmember Muller's hesitations. There's, there's definitely, you know, risk here, and that's why we're including the endorsement, you know, from CCWD and asking member agencies to acknowledge and accept, you know, the level of risk that's identified and involved. Um, but it, it seems to me that, um, that we have to start someplace Ultimately, maybe this particular project isn't the one, but I think recycled water is, is the future in California. Reuse is in the future of California. And we need to jump in and get our feet wet. And um, so I'm willing to do this with these um, protections in mind. And I'd like to thank um, you know, Alex and, and Vivian for really spending a lot of time evaluating these documents and um, you know, analyzing um, the risks here. So thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to add a couple of com do you have comments. I'd, add, I'd like to add a couple of, I guess, some clarification. So what's at risk here? Um, so there is support across this council. I understand that for recycled water in our community, and there is and that's pretty enthusiastic. And there is support at the sewer authority for recycled water in our community. We need to move forward in a smart way. Um, so we're not wasting our resources. Um, for the 25% design, what the city is, what, what, what the, what's at risk is, without a business plan, we would be speculating. We don't do that with city money. We would be, they would be like saying, we're going to make an investment, and it might go up, it might work, or you might lose it all. And, and so we, the city pays for, we pay for 51% of the study, uh, and 51% of that study is uh, you know, $93,000, which would be like saying, I'm going to go spend $93,000, and it may never come to fruition, or I'm because you just don't know without a business plan. With if if you have a business plan as a pre prerequisite that shows a potentially viable project under those conditions, viable meaning it will pay back and, and the customer can afford it. Under those conditions, I would support uh, put, uh, spending the $93,000 on the on the design for recycled water. But I think the business plan should precede it. Um, but I just want to make it clear that what's at risk, and, and to the public who may be watching at home, that what's at risk is speculative money. And I don't think we should do that with, with our city resources, our city dollars. I think smart money is to um, develop the business plan, and that's a fork in the road. We know what, what, re, what requirements need to be in place with the business plan, what what's the customer need to agree to, what's the distributor need to agree to for recycled water to work. And if it's viable, then we, can, then we move forward. Then I think it's smart. Otherwise, it's risk. So those, those are my comments. And there's some, some buzz to the left here. I'm sorry, there's some buzz from staff. Are we just hand signals, or is there something to share? I will get you one second. I'll get, I'll get you in. Hold on. <laughs> Nothing? Okay, thank you. Um, Councilmember Penrose. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate and, and maybe clarify a little bit what you just stated. I think that the business plan is something we ought to be going ahead with, and I think that the 25% design phase ought to be decided oh, that we go forward with that after the business plan has been completed, that it's not part of this, it's not phase two, it's another issue. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Council Member Frazier. Um, I agree with many of the comments that have been set up here and especially in light last week at CCAG, there was an expert from Stanford. Stanford's been doing some incredible things with recycling water and thermal energy and part of their sustainability. And, and they're part of the, the Renew It um, Center, and that's reinventing the nation's urban water infrastructure. So there's a lot of action going on about that. Um, when I look at this report from this consultant, still talking about membrane filtration, 
that is that is such old technology. I mean, some of the things they were talking about is anaerobic digesters, um, just really cutting edge technologies. Um, two things, I, I agree with the business plan. Um, to the SAM members, I have grave concerns over the consultant that's um, recommended on here. I think we need to look at people who are really doing cutting edge recycling technology because this is this is old school 10 years ago. This is rehashing reports of when I was on the SAM plant. If um, I can add, just, I'll, let you, please, I'll let, let you finish, but since you're talking about the consultant that is recommended here, um, there was a RFP done and two um, responses were received. They were both scored. Um, uh, I forget the scoring, the total score, but they were um, scored very high. There, the, the, highings, the higher score consulted by just a very small, very, very small margin uh, was not was not recommended. The second consultant was recommended, um, and they have since they have since um, revised their RFP response. So I've not seen a rescoring of it, but I just wanted to give you that information that there was two qualified uh, uh, consultants uh, who contributed. Well, I really think we need to be talking about to universities, people who are truly looking at the cutting edge technologies. Um, and, and there's another big thing you mentioned, I think John mentioned, is storage. Storage is a huge component of recycling water. Where do you put it if you can do it? Um, you know, we fleshed it out. There is only one customer. So in addition to this business plan, I want something in writing from that one customer is what is their threshold? Because I think that data is important in this business plan if this is even feasible for us to do. In our hearts, yes, we want recycled water. It was a ballot measure in the community years ago, Measure P. Um, but it never had any funding. How it would be funded, wh how it would be done, it's just, it's almost like mom and apple pie. Yeah, we love it, but there wasn't anything be behind it. So. Um, before we go spend money after money and more years after years on this. You know, if we're really going to do it, let's find out if it truly is feasible. And if it's not, there are other ways that we can look at to grab water, whether it's storm water, whether it's irrigation ponds, whether we're collecting water off runoff of hills if it ever does rain again. Um, but we're, we're spending a lot of money here, so definitely I'm in favor of the business plan. So with that, from what I'm hearing, additional comments? I'm sorry? Staff? Does staff have additional comments or more hand signals? I think I've made mine. So the conversation that we were having while you were discussing a little bit is just on the business plan and in speaking with uh, our city sewer engineer, we're looking at approximately $30,000 uh, for funding that type of a business plan and that would give us a little bit of cushion too, according to Vivian. Um, we'd also have to look at, so the direction I'm hearing from the council is task one is to basically uh, moving forward with this business plan and then um, based on that, then moving with, conti contingent upon that, then you're moving to a 25% design. Is that what I'm hearing? Almost. What I'm hearing is direction to the SAM board members to give feedback to SAM, that to, for SAM to have a business plan developed than everything else you said. So basically then there would be no action this evening of funding for the project basically advising the SAM board directors, the Half Moon Bay SAM board directors to take that feedback back to the SAM board as to the council's uh, direction on, on this item at this point? That is my understanding. Yeah, because, you know, the costing of the business plan, right? So that's going to be another item for discussion. And then it'll have to come back, I guess, to each member agency again. That would be, that would, that would be the correct way of how we would do it. I know that people are chomping at the bit to move the project and, forward. And then so. we are. We're enthusiastic to move forward, but we're also in the middle of our budget process at SAM as well. That would be the appropriate way then. And, and we, can, we can put that in there, and, and we would be online for 51% of that. Uh, and so we could potentially suggest that as a budget uh, item, put that in there, and then um, uh, push forward. And, and, and we want to push forward. We'll be super clear. We, but we want to push forward in a smart way, and they want to just move forward and, and, and make mistakes. So. I did have a, a call from a Montero board member suggesting that we 
if we adopt, uh, approve the budget for the 25% design that we get the general manager to place it on Monday's agenda at SAM, but um, I, we'll discuss it as part of the budget. I, I do think it would be good for staff to, after tonight, to contact the general manager at SAM or perhaps put something in writing that outlines the decision points of tonight. And I can certainly have that conversation as well, but. That, that would be helpful. Um, and I would also further like to ask uh, staff to, um, if you could outline the, um, I guess the, the sections or the key elements you would want to see uh, in an appropriate business plan, that would be helpful so that there's no misunderstanding of the kinds of things we want to see in there. Uh, one person's business plan might be different than another's, and I think it should be pretty hard no, it's pretty fact-based. Um, and and so, so that would be very helpful for us. And then that could be uh, uh, an item we could bring uh, with us to the sewer authority meeting to share. And, and to point out too that this would be an independent consultant preparing the business plan somebody with you know a financial advisor familiar with the technology so that this would not be an srt task item and it would be separate and i like the idea of doing a tour and uh I'll, we'll bring back that suggestion it's a good idea any other comments or input alex do you have any questions or comments so we the direction that i'm hearing from council this evening is to one, draft a letter contacting uh, to the general manager of SAM, uh, letting them know the decision points of this evening, uh, which will outline the sections and elements of the business plan that we're asking as task one and what we want to see those elements. Um, so Alex, is that, is that two different things, right? Yes, that is so correct. So one is the, the, the elements that for our decision this evening, and the second item is the elements of a decision plan, of a, of a business plan. Uh, the business plan elements do not, be, you said a letter to them? Were you, were you envisioning there'd be a letter to them or just a note, a summary? I, I was envisioning an, an email or a letter, but something in, in writing. Something more formal? Something, <laughs> something more formal. As it's coming from the council, I, I would, I would recommend that it be a formal letter, just sent, letting them know of the council action of this evening. Would you concur, City Manager? Yeah. Okay. And don't forget that the business plan must be prepared by a, an, a second independent financial advisor. Correct. That's the third item on the list. Yes. Okay. If and don't forget receiving the endorsement of the business plan from CCWD. We'll include that as well. So we'll take what what we're in, what I'm envisioning right now is taking a lot of the pieces of the staff report that came forward um, this evening of our concerns and being able to articulate that in a formal letter to the general manager at SAM and basically memorializing the council's uh, stance or position currently on this recycled water project. That's great. Uh, I think that captures everything I heard. I think that was um, excellent staff work, um, very detailed, very thoughtful. Uh, and I appreciate it very much. And with that, I move on to the next agenda item, which is any future uh, agenda items for discussion. Hearing none. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Going, hammers up, hammers up. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how council will feel about this, but I was thinking, um, we might want to, on uh, a future agenda, probably you know early in May, because the election's in June, um, supporting Measure AA, the, um, the $12 parcel tax for Bay Restoration. Um, probably need to be on the first meeting in May to make a... To make, it, so... Uh, so, so uh, Councilmember Muller also concurs with that direction. So, what uh, what do you envision this being? Just an informational item? Uh, a, re a resolution. A resolution. Of support. A resolution of support. Got it. I concur with that. Let's, uh, if we can, City Manager. Thank you very much. And with that, that concludes this evening's meeting. Thank you.